Hey everyone, Sean here for Lambda School. And in this video, we're gonna look at improving upon a first pass solution. Or in other words, we're going to look a bit at how to take an existing first pass solution and how to actually improve upon it. So from our last video, we ended with this working solution of an nth-fib uh, implementation, where in this implementation, we had uh, a recursive implementation that has a base case that checks to see if our input n was less than two. And if it was, that's when it would return n and exit out of the recursion. Otherwise, it would perform two additional recursive calls with inputs that decremented for n minus one and n minus two, with the idea that eventually we would make enough recursive calls and n would decrement enough such that it would eventually hit the base case of n less than two. So now the question becomes, we have this implementation, is it, is it a good implementation? Are there problems with it that we could address in order to, to make it better? And the answer is that is yes. And to see that, what we could do is to try to type that implementation into a Python REPL and run it with, for example, an input n of 50, like I did here. And what you'll see is that that implementation is going to hang. It's not going to return you an answer in any sort of timely fashion. And 50 really isn't that big of an input. So this is kind of unacceptable. Right, there's a problem with the efficiency of our recursive implementation. And ideally, we'd seek to improve upon it and make it better such that it'd be able to handle an input of this large, and ideally for much, much larger inputs than even just 50. So to kind of start to answer the question of why this particular implementation is so inefficient, we need to take a look at its runtime complexity. And it turns out the runtime complexity of this recursive implementation of ours comes out to an O of two to the power of N, which as you might recall, is really, really bad. And to kind of see how it achieves that runtime complexity visually, we can look and kind of chart out all the recursive calls it might make. So for example, here, when we make a recursive, an initial recursive call with an input of four, when we do that, it needs to now spin off a whole bunch of extra recursive calls, right? It needs to make a recursive call with three and then two, and then each of those is going to spin off additional recursive calls. In the case of three, it's going to spin off a recursive call with two and then one. In the case of the one, it's going to um, reach the base case of n less than two, so there it's going to terminate. But then the recursive call with two is going to spin off and make two more recursive calls with one and zero. And both of these are going to, are going to meet the base case criteria. And so those are going to end the recursion as well. And we also see on the other side, there's another recursive call on the right hand side of the uh, root recursive call. And that creates some more recursive calls with one and zero as well. So those, that's a map of all of the recursive calls that are made for, an, for a call with n equal to four. So let's see what happens now when we increase it by one. So we go from n with four to n plus one or n equal to five. And now we see that when we call our nth fib, our recursive nth fib with n equal to five, it, it, it contain, this, this tree contains the entire nth fib with four call on the left hand side. And then it makes another recursive call on the right with nth fib with n equal to three. So you can see just by adding plus one to our input n that we've added a bunch of additional work, a bunch of extra additional recursive calls that our machine now needs to chew through. What's also interesting, if you look a bit more closely at this, is that it turns out there's also a lot of repeated work, right? So we see in the blue circles, those two, we're making multiple nth fib calls with an input of three. And we're also making multiple nth fib calls with an input of two, as we see highlighted in the yellow circles. So essentially these are all, this is all work that is being repeated, it's redundant, right? 
but this is a big reason, or this is the main bottleneck as to why our implementation is very inefficient, is that it's not taking advantage of the fact that it's repeating a bunch of work and it's doing that extra work. Um, it's in the dark about the fact that it's repeating a bunch of this extra work. So that is a possible avenue for something that we can seek to remedy with an improved implementation. And so in order to do that, we're going to talk about this strategy called caching, or you might also hear it called memoization, but essentially they mean the same thing. And caching and memoization uh, crop up in a whole bunch of different contexts. Not, it's not a strategy that's only applicable in uh, algorithms like we're seeing in this case. Caching happens as well, like for example, browsers will locally cache web pages that it knows that you frequently detect. And basically what that means then is that whenever you log, you open up your browser and type in, for example, google.com or youtube.com or facebook.com, those sites that you, know, you most likely go to very often, chances are that your browser is going to have a local copy of the code for that site cached in your, local, in your machine locally so that when you enter that URL into your, machine, into your browser, your browser doesn't actually need to go and perform a network request to some remote server in order to fetch that web page. It's already stored locally on your machine. And so for you, the end user, you see that that page comes up really, really quickly. So that's kind of the idea here. The idea is that caching or memoization is all just about saving work that's been previously done. And that's applicable for our situation here, right? Because we saw with uh, the nth fib call with n equal to five that there's a whole bunch of repeated work. So what would be nice is instead of repeating all that redundant work across multiple recursive calls, is if we instead, the first time we perform that recursive call, we store that answer in some sort of some sort of cache. And so that the next time any recursive call needs that answer, instead of having to perform that redundant work, it could just go and access the cache and grab the relevant answer. So it doesn't have to perform any additional extra work. As far as what caching might look like, we have a number of ways we could uh, actually implement it. Uh, most straightforward would probably just be using a hash table. Right. In this case, the ends, the input ends can be the keys in our hash table. And then the values can just be the answer that is calculated for that particular input n. So here again, we might use a hash table or uh, arrays would work just fine as well, actually. So what would it actually look like if we were to implement caching or augment our caching, I should say, to our nth fib implementation is what we could do is we could add the cache as a parameter to our recursive call so that we can then pass that cache into each additional recursive call afterwards. Uh, and so then we can, first of all, we keep the base case. So that doesn't change. And in fact, uh, the overall logic of the code doesn't actually change. So the base case stays the same, but then we can add another clause that says, hey, we check the cache with the input n. And if there is an answer in there that is greater than uh, an initial seeded value of zero, right? So we check that's greater than zero because uh, initially our cache will just contain a whole bunch of zeros. So if we see any values that are greater than zero, that will mean that we've computed some answer previously for that input n. So if we find cache of n greater than zero, that means we've already calculated that answer beforehand and we'll go and just return uh, that n. Lastly, if we don't find that answer in the cache, we are going to populate that cache entry with n with recursive calls. And I just noticed there is an issue with this code because in these two recursive calls, the nth fib n minus one plus nth fib n minus two, those are not receiving the cache as a parameter. So uh, keep that in mind. The correct code should be nth fib n minus one comma cache 
plus nth fib n minus two comma cache. So the cache should be getting passed to these two nth fib calls as well, so that those two can also take advantage of the cache. And again, if we want to actually, we'll, we'll have to go and initialize the cache outside of our recursive function and then pass that in to the initial call to our nthfib function. And we can, again can do that in a number of ways. We can, uh, for example, use a, a list like we're doing with the first line, or the second option can be using a dictionary. And then we might call our nth fib. If you try this now, I mean, you can try this code now in your Python REPL and print out the answer you get for running nth fib with 50 again and passing in the cache. So now what's the runtime complexity of our new and improved augmented solution? It turns out now at this point, it comes out to O of n, which is a huge improvement, right? So that's nice. We augmented our solution, got its runtime complexity really, really, really down. So now you'll see that you can pass in really, really large inputs to your augmented version of the nth fib function, and it should, for the most part, be able to handle those no problem. I say for the most part because um, we can't fully escape the fact that our implementation is still recursive. And just the fact that we are using recursion will inherently bring with it some, some baggage. Uh, and that is a, a lot of additional memory overhead that comes with calling a bunch of additional functions. And plus, if you give it an input that is too large, uh, your machine will still run out of resources and you'll basically get an error that says that you've exceeded the maximum recursion depth. So again, even though we augmented our recursive implementation to use a cache, it is a lot better in terms of runtime. That being said, just again, the fact that we're utilizing recursion um, will still impose some restrictions on us in terms of the maximum input size that we can give it. So at this point, if we're looking to make our solution even better, uh, it's time to consider perhaps an iterative version that is less resource intensive than the recursive implementation. So we wanted to now think about how to change this implementation into an iterative implementation. And there's one important fact that you need to realize. And that is that, do we actually need any answers other than the n minus, so given some n, do we actually need anything else besides n minus one and n minus two? Right, because according to the Fibonacci formula, n is just the sum of n minus one plus n minus two. And so in that case, maybe instead of building up this cache and keeping all these previous answers, why, do, why don't we just keep n minus one and n minus two as variables and just update them as we loop through all the way up from zero to n minus one. So in this code here, you'll see that we initialize n underscore one to one and n underscore two to zero. And those correspond with the zero Fibonacci number and the first Fibonacci number. So that's what we'll initialize them to. In other words, uh, these two initializations correspond to our base case in our recursive implementation of if n is less than two, we return n. So either one or zero. And then when we loop up from zero all the way to n minus one, the answer is going to be the sum of n underscore one plus n underscore two. So right here is our Fibonacci formula. And then all we have to do after that is update our n underscore two and n underscore one variables. So n underscore two needs to get shifted over plus one. So that now becomes n underscore one. And then likewise, n underscore one needs to get shifted up once so that it is now updated to be uh, our answer. And then lastly, after all this looping, we can just return our answer, which will be the answer we're expecting for our nth Fibonacci number. So that's a, an iterative version of our Fibonacci. And so, Again, with the runtime complexity of this one, it actually matches the, version, the, the, 
recursive version that utilizes caching slash memoization. And then the question I want to leave you with is what is the space complexity or what is the memory usage that this iterative Fibonacci implementation is utilizing? Think about that and try to compare that with what you think the space complexity is for the recursive implementation that utilized caching.